Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you've uh, managed to recharge yourself with some coffee and refreshments. We're now going to move into the section of the event where we look at some views about compassion from uh, our two great religious traditions, uh, Christianity and then Buddhism. Uh, so our next speaker is Father Richard Conrad. Uh, Father Conrad gained a PhD in chemistry at Cambridge before... <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the other place, indeed, uh, before joining the Dominican Order and studying philosophy and theology in Oxford and Rome. Uh, he's been novice master of the Dominicans, uh, prior or parish priest in several houses, teaches dogmatic theology, Thomas Aquinas in Oxford and at Maryvale Institute in Birmingham. He was also the vice regent here at Blackfriars for many years and was indeed the vice regent when I first came here and we were all extremely grateful to his uh, uh, wonderful and beneficent reign. Uh, and now he's uh, director of the Aquinas Institute uh, uh, here as well. So please give a warm welcome to Father Richard Conrad. Oh, and if anyone needs a handout, hasn't got one, Mikawai has some, raise your hand now and it will get to you just before he starts speaking. So there's a handout with much of my talk on it and the main text and some pictures will appear on PowerPoint, the text for those who are watching by video and don't have the handout. So thanks for the welcome. This is something of a slightly eclectic meditation on some Christian views on compassion. And I'd like to start with a few words on etymology and psychology. Slightly reticent words because of the excellent presentation we had from Sam and the discussion afterwards. And of course, as we all know, etymology is not the same as meaning. Nevertheless, I think in classical Hebrew, the etymology is more on the surface and at least provides us a way into some of the concepts and phenomena we are looking at. So compassion sounds like a Latin word that means to suffer with. It can involve fellow feeling. And in the New Testament, the main word that is translated as to have compassion is the nice sonorous word splanknidzomai, which literally means to have your guts in a twist. That in fact is not found in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, that began being translated by Jews in Alexandria in the third century BC. It seems to have been a coinage of the Jews in the diaspora trying to put into Greek the Hebrew word that they were used to. In the New Testament, we find Jesus having compassion on people and some characters in his parables, like the father of the prodigal son, have compassion. Their guts are in a twist, so to speak. And there are a few other words in the New Testament that also seem to imply a suffering with. The Hebrew word I'm thinking of is riham, which is a verb that comes from the noun for womb, for your innards. It's the same idea then as splanknidzomai, you have a feeling in your guts. It's sometimes paired in the Old Testament with some less graphic words like hanan, to be gracious, or show favour. The translators of the Septuagint use slightly less graphic Greek words to translate riham, like oiktiro, to have pity, and eleo, to have mercy. But the etymology of riham and splanknidzomai suggests that you can sometimes feel someone else's suffering here under the diaphragm, 
where Plato located the epithumeticon soul, the form of life that has these deep and powerful feelings for sex, for food, and for compassion. The implication then is that you can feel someone else's suffering and of course that is expressed in the many images of the Pieta, the image of pity, this one is Michelangelo's of course, where Mary shares the suffering of her son who is crucified. So can we know how someone else feels. We sometimes say, I know how you feel, but it's sometimes a hollow claim. Until a couple of years ago, I had no idea what it's like to feel old. And now I do, and it's rather alarming. And I look back with sympathy and compassion on my parents and other people for whom I did not make allowances when I was young. We don't always know how other people feel and yet sometimes there can be a feeling which is powerful and at least in some way matches the suffering of someone else. So there's a story of a woman standing at a bus stop with her baby in her arms and the baby wriggled out of her arms and she saw the bus crush the baby. And when they picked her up, she had sweated blood. And what was depicted in that image of the Pieta is expressed by Julian of Norwich. In her vision, she saw the compassion of our blessed lady, St. Mary. For Christ and she were so one in love that the greatness of her love was the cause of the greatness of her pain. Forever the higher, the mightier, the sweeter that the love is, the more sorrow it is to the lover to see that body in pain that he loved. So in fact it is possible if love and imagination and empathy and so on work, to get over something of the possible barrier between people and really empathise and have compassion with the other. The Old Testament ascribes compassion to God. The Hebrew scriptures speak of God having compassion using that verb riham and other verbs that can be translated as to have compassion, to have mercy. So in Psalm 116, gracious is Adonai and just, our God has compassion. You have that powerful picture in Isaiah, can a woman forget her nursling, turn from compassion on the son of her womb? Should even these forget, yet will I not forget you. There are certain texts in the Old Testament that suggest God's compassion are a form of forbearance. <coughs> so in Psalm 103, merciful and gracious is Adonai, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. He does not do to us in accordance with our sins. As a father has compassion on his sons, Adonai has compassion on those who reverence him. Though I suspect that in context, that means that a father who is cross might eventually leave off beating his son and let him alone. And God does not hit us as hard as we deserve. But you find other more powerful texts like again in Isaiah, for a brief moment I forsook you, but with immense compassion I will gather you. In a flood of anger I hid my face momentarily from you, 
but with eternal loving kindness, I will have compassion on you. We find God having compassion on the oppressed. And if they cry to him, he will hear them. In the Book of Wisdom, we find God having mercy on all things, loving all things that exist, loathing nothing that he has made. Otherwise, it wouldn't even exist. And you have that graphic image in the New Testament where Jesus says, aren't five sparrows sold for two farthings? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. That picture of God's love, his awareness of even the tiniest thing. There's a Jewish story about the Exodus in which the Jews are set free from Egypt and the Egyptians are drowned. And in this Jewish story, the angels are clapping and dancing and God says, stop, because my children are drowning in the sea. A Jewish awareness of God's compassion even for the enemies of his people. So in the light of that powerful imagery, do we want to say that God suffers with things and people that suffer? Does God, as God, literally suffer? And there are plenty of philosophers of religion today who want to say yes. Here's part of a text from Rem Edwards written in 1978, something of a straw man um, some decades later, but it does exemplify certain strands of thought. For Edwards, if we say God doesn't suffer, we have to dismiss as misleading, as merely figurative speech, the idea that God loves his creatures. We must get rid of the language of love. He thinks that Anselm and Aquinas and all the rest do that because they're infected by pagan Greek ideas. And he quotes Berdiev, who complains about the idea of God in people like Aquinas, implying that people in that tradition are afraid to ascribe to God the inner conflict and tragedy characteristic of all life, but are quite happy to ascribe to God anger, jealousy and vengeance. Well, it's important to read the great thinkers themselves, like Pseudodionysius, Anselm and Aquinas, and find out what they really say. For them and for Mother Julian of Norwich and so on, in fact, to say that God does not change doesn't of course mean that God is impassive or static. And people like Aquinas and Julian want to say that it's images like anger and jealousy and vengeance, which are purely metaphorical. But when we speak of God's love, we are speaking of something literally true. It is literally true that God loves creatures and people. And indeed for Aquinas and for Pseudodionysius, the reason for creation and salvation is the immensity of God's overflowing love, which Dennis calls eros, a kind of ecstatic love, and St. Thomas calls friendship. St. Thomas picks up that Aristotelian notion of friendship that implies an element of equality and reciprocity and says there is a friendship between God and us. The triune God, Father, Son and Spirit, 
want to give themselves to us in friendship, to be known and loved, possessed and enjoyed, now and forever, somehow in the world to come, blowing our mind so that the incomprehensible God in some degree becomes known to us and we share God's own happiness. But looking back to what Sam explained in the previous presentation, we can recognise that Rem Edwards was being rather wooden in saying that love and compassion have to be emotional states and unfulfilled yearnings. Even all human love is not like that. We can imagine a wise and deliberate commitment to the good of the other, one that proactively cherishes the good of the other, something that is much more than mere emotion. And if with human beings, love can be a lot more than just emotion, then to speak of the love of the unfathomably great God is of course to speak analogically, as St. Thomas would put it. We cannot fathom the immensity of God's love and all those metaphors of God's gut-wrenching and maternal instincts and so on, we need not have been as nervous as the Septuagint translators were of such anthropomorphisms. They are important metaphors to speak of something of the greatness of God's love. Scripture rightly uses a whole range of powerful metaphors for the immensity of God's unfathomable love. But the Old Testament itself urges us to recognise the incomprehensibility of God. At the burning bush, God reveals his name to Moses, a name too sacred to pronounce. But if you learn Hebrew, you might realise that it could at least well be the third person masculine singular of the imperfect, of the hyphial causative and declarative of hawa, which is the archaic form of haya, the verb to be. Useful also for dinner parties if you want to show off. <laughs> um, there's a form of the Hebrew verb that can express causing someone else to do something or exhibiting a quality. And the name, that sacred name, could well mean he is causing things to be and his being is resplendent. And the name seems to be explained by that passage of the burning bush, I am who am, in Greek, ego eimi ha own, I am the one who is. So God is being, God possesses being, and all creatures must receive being. And there's that radical difference between God and all little beings. <coughs> God is incomprehensible. To whom will you compare me? Says God in Isaiah. I was delighted in the Doctor Who stories of the great intelligence in the 1960s and I was delighted that the great intelligence made a reappearance at the end of the previous run of Doctor Who before the present one but rather too many people picture God as a being among others something a bit like the great intelligence but more benevolent. A bigger and better version of a human person. And I think it's that 
which leads some people to think God has to suffer because his love might be just a bigger and better version of a slightly wooden picture of our love. But God is the transcendent creator who alone possesses being and we cannot imagine the immensity of his love. So for human beings to say, I know how you feel, isn't always a hollow claim. There can be empathy and compassion and an attempt to put yourself in the shoes of the other and have something in you, in your guts or in your mind, that somehow matches the suffering of the other. And there will be something immeasurably greater in God, not that God changes or has emotions, but God knows more deeply than we know our own suffering, our own problems and anguish, and God's love is more deeply sustaining than we could possibly fathom. And so, although St Thomas doesn't speak much of compassion when speaking of God, he does speak of God's mercy. He speaks of God's love as proactive, not responding to the goodness of things, but creating and sustaining that goodness. And that love takes the form of mercy. Here's a painting of Mother Julian with that vision of the hazelnut in her hand. She saw something like a little ball in her hand and wondered what it might be. And she was answered, it is all that is made. I wondered how long it could last for it seemed as though it might suddenly fade away to nothing, it was so small. And I was answered, it lasts and ever shall last, for God loveth it. And even so hath everything being by the love of God. So Julian expresses in her eloquent Middle English, the same picture that St Thomas gives us, of God's proactive love, holding all things in being. And that love can take the form of mercy, misericordia, tender-heartedness, even being sorrowful at heart. We can be sorrowful at heart over the misery of others. And we can apply that to God, not that God feels an emotion of misery, but God does more deeply and more proactively what mercy leads us to do to alleviate the misery of others. God does that much more deeply The merciful person endeavours to dispel the misery of the other as if it were his own. And God does not sorrow in any sense of suffering, but he knows the need of others. And it is God's role to dispel misery. And in fact, what God does for all things involves goodness and justice and generosity and mercy. God goes out to create things goodness, gives them the gifts and perfections that belong to them in wisdom and justice, generously not because he needs it, and bringing things to their perfection out of mercy. Though that raises of course the problem of evil why things still do suffer and we don't know 
Julian says, how all manner things shall be well in the end. So God is merciful and we are called to imitate the mercy of God. There's a traditional list of the works of mercy which St Thomas lists but that's common property of all the medieval theologians. There are the bodily works of mercy which are based on that picture of the Last Judgment in Matthew 25 and on the book of Tobit where Tobit buries the dead. And this is slightly adapted for the medieval um, context to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, receive guests, visit the sick, ransom captives, set them free, bury the dead. Those are the bodily works of mercy and the medievals invented the spiritual works of mercy to teach the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, console the sorrowful, correct a sinner, forgive one who offends you, bear another's burdens, pray for all. Going out spiritually to help people. And they go into English as the works of mercy. Um, St Thomas speaks of them as eleomosine, a Latin version of the Greek word eleomosune, which means to do a work of mercy or to give alms. Alms is the English shrinking of that Greek Latin word. St. Th thinking of compassion burnout, Thomas in fact would say we must exercise all of this wisely and prudently and being aware of the order of charity because we have differing degrees of duty towards our families, our friends, our fellow citizens, distant people and our enemies. We don't have to like those who are nasty to us, but we have to love them, we have to want their good and pray that they will be with us in heaven. So we have to pray for all and help those in need who cross our paths and with whom our lives are bound up. And those works of mercy, like mercy itself and all forms of benefaction, Thomas lists under charity, agape, and charity in its fullest sense for Thomas is in fact something divine. It's a participation in the Holy Spirit who is the divine personal love, uncreated charity. There's an implication then that at least in their richest sense, doing works of mercy make us ministers of God's own care and love to those around us. It's part of the imitation of God that Jesus urges upon us. So let us turn to Jesus himself. Jesus is seen by Christians as the eternal Son of God the Father but also the Logos, the eternal self-expression of God the Father, so to speak, the impress of the Father's substance, 
in the letter to the Hebrews, like the impress made by a stamp or die. Jesus is the icon, the image of the invisible God. When the word became flesh, Jesus lived out as man what he eternally is as God. He is the revelation of God the Father. So Jesus, in his behaviour, makes flesh the Father's mercy. His behaviour towards sinners and people in need puts into physical expression the mercy of God to all. And when people complained, he told parables like that of the prodigal son, where the father has compassion, his guts wrench over the son who was lost and is found. And Pope John Paul II explored this in his second encyclical, Dives in Misericordia, God who is rich in mercy, and he explored there how that parable of the prodigal son captures the quality of God's mercy, which does not merely pity and belittle the sinner, but delights to restore the dignity of the one who wandered. So the ministry of Jesus and his teaching is to do with the mercy of God. A lot of Christian theologians seem to change their tune when they talk about the passion and death of Jesus. And they focus rather on the justice or even the wrath of God. Somehow God's justice, or some abstract justice, demands satisfaction, which Jesus pays. There is no scriptural warrant for that image, but it's an ancient part of the Christian tradition, and I think it can be employed as a model but only a model, and there are people who've done it satisfactorily. Human beings cannot by themselves honour God as he deserves, and we failed to honour him. Jesus does give perfect honour and obedience to the Father, but he shares that honour and obedience with us so that we become able in Christ again to love and obey God. But in the 15th century, a new idea was invented about how God imposes on the innocent Jesus the punishment that was really due to us. And that picture has no basis at all in scripture or tradition or liturgy, and I think it's offensive to pious ears though there are plenty of people to defend it today. But what does scripture actually say? It doesn't say that Jesus had to reconcile God to man, as if God had turned away from us in a huff. I mean, God can't turn. It says that God in Christ reconciled us to God. God reaches out to bring us back to himself. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth I shall draw all things to myself. And Julian, in following the tradition, says, I saw no wrath but on man's part, and that forgiveth he in us. God hasn't got out of sorts with us. In sin, we get out of sorts with God and find his law irksome, not a delight. And God undoes that 
awkwardness in us. Indeed, Jesus presents his passion as the great revelation of God. He says about God the Father, from now on you know him and have seen him after he has committed himself to his passion at the Last Supper. There's a traditional way of showing the Holy Trinity in Western Christian art. That's a left-hand picture. It's the Gnadenstuhl or mercy seat depiction where you have God the Father seated on his throne of mercy, of grace, holding the crucified Son with the Holy Spirit as a dove between them. Um, this is an alabaster from Nottingham and God the Father has some rather nice dreadlocks and is raising his hand in the Dominican gesture of blessing, though he's lost a couple of his fingers. In the events that happened, the passion of Christ and things like the coming of the Spirit at Jesus' baptism, God was revealed as Trinity. But the limitation on that picture is that you can see the Father's face without having to look at Jesus. So Eric Gill, who was a Dominican, a lay Dominican, and therefore, of course, got things right, um, he did a variant on that picture where the father is holding the crucified son before his face. And the face of Christ is the making visible of the face of God. The face of Christ on the cross is the face, the visibility of God. After all, as the inscription says, Jesus is shedding off his blood is the new covenant, the ultimate pledge of God's loyalty towards us, whatever we throw at him. So Jesus' passion is the revelation of God's loyalty. Indeed, John says at the beginning of his gospel, we beheld his glory Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and loyalty, meaning we saw Christ on the cross. Indeed, we find in St. John's Gospel that Jesus' crucifixion reveals who he is. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he. So I think we need to change our picture. Rather than seeing Jesus on the cross as a kind of confrontation between the representative of sinful man and an angry God, it is the confrontation between the mercy and compassion of God and angry men. Christ on the cross is not the representative man looking with terror at an angry God, but God become flesh, looking with forgiveness and compassion at representative angry men, those who put him there and mock him. And we find also in St. John's Gospel that Jesus bowed his head and handed over the Spirit. Paredoken top pneuma. His passion is the revelation of God's love and so the great channel of the coming into the world of that personal love whom we call the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus' passion is the revelation of God's mercy. Not, I should say, revealing that God as God suffers, but enacting in history that dimension of God's infinite love, which is mercy and compassion 
a proactive healing, mercy and compassion. The Middle Ages made a great use of the image of pity, the Pietà, and it took two forms. On the left we have an altar screen from Wellingham in Norfolk, um, a defaced picture, but it's a picture of Christ with the passion instruments around him, standing in his tomb with his side pierced with the spear and the sponge and the nails and everything else. An invitation to contemplate the suffering of Christ. And on the right, we have an anonymous Polish Pietà, <coughs> the image of Mary's compassion. And all these images and similar images like the way of the cross you find in modern Catholic churches, they urge us to be moved by the suffering of Christ. Indeed, John Paul II suggests that in Christ, God is asking us for mercy, for compassion. Christ is asking us for mercy and Christ in those who suffer in solidarity with him is asking us for mercy, giving us that dignity. So the right hand picture in particular um, reminds us that Jesus is one of our family through Mary God has become a relative of each of us. It was part of the medieval mentality, I mean, alongside many less pleasant things, but it was part of the medieval mentality that every human being is literally a brother or sister of God because God has become one of our family. And so everyone should be precious to us since they were that precious to God. So there's that quotation from Mother Julian, enlarged here. She speaks of the compassion of our Blessed Lady St Mary. The greatness of her love was cause of the greatness of her pain. I saw a substance of kind love a power of natural love, continued by grace, lifted to a divine level that his creatures have to him, which kind love, which natural love was most fulsomely shown in his sweet mother. For so much as she loved him more than all other, her pain passed all other. But that picture reminds us that while Mary was his mother, we are his brothers and sisters and there should be a natural compassion for Christ. A family feeling. If he has suffered, we should feel with him. And so in a brilliant lecture given here in 1988, Eamon Duffy quoted this poem where the natural love for Christ is a kind of basis for the grace of conversion. I said I could not weep, I was so hard-hearted. She answered me with words shortly that smarted. Lo, nature shall move thee, thou must be converted. Thine own father this night is dead. In Jesus' is father of the world to come, lo, thus she thwarted, so my son is bobbed and of his life robbed. Forsooth then I sobbed, verifying the word she said to me, who cannot weep may learn at me. So we are urged to have compassion with Christ and imitating Mary to have compassion with all those who share Christ's suffering. <laughs>
And so going on a bit further with that compassion that Julian gives expression to, she speaks of a kind of compassion, a suffering that all creatures had. I mean, she's thinking back to the idea that at Christ's crucifixion, the earth quaked, the sun was darkened, and the moon was turned to blood, which may well be literally true, because if Jesus died on the 3rd of April, 33 AD, then as the sun rose that evening, it was eclipsed and was the colour of blood. So she speaks of a great running between Christ and us. When he was in pain, we were in pain, all creatures that might suffer pain suffered with him. The firmament and earth failed for sorrow in their kind in the time of Christ dying. And we share in Christ's pain. And so God has suffered pain and dying on the cross. Herbert McCabe, who used to lecture brilliantly in this very room, wrote against the idea that God as God suffered, emphasising though that God is more intimately involved with each creature than any other creature could be, but also pointing out that if Jesus is true God and true man, we can say that God literally has suffered in the way in which we do, in torture and death, though I would want to add much more sensitively and deeply than we can. God has suffered in solidarity with us, or should we follow that text from Julian about us suffering in solidarity with Christ? St. Paul presents the whole creation as groaning in travail in a great act of giving birth. And you have those medieval pictures of Christ on the cross giving birth to the church. In the biblical story, the first Adam sleeps in the garden and God forms Eve, his bride, from his side. Christ, the new Adam, sleeps in death where there was a garden, John tells us, and blood and water flow from his side symbolising the Holy Spirit and the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist that build up the body of Christ. So here we have one picture among many, but here you have, in fact, Christ standing next to himself. Christ as midwife, bringing the church, his bride, the new Eve, from his body, as he groans in travail on the cross, giving birth to the new creation with Mary and John sharing Christ's passion and above the sun and the moon quaking and hiding their faces. So we can say that Christ, God become man, has enacted God's compassion, suffered in solidarity with his creatures, or better still, we are able in compassion to suffer with God, sharing his compassion for all things and all people. Ministers of that mercy shown on the cross, as well as entering into Jesus' journey through suffering to new life. So have compassion with me for overusing my time. Thank you. Well, we, we did begin a, a little behind schedule.
So I think we, we should uh, uh, have five or so minutes for, for questions. Uh, it, it, should there be any, and then we'll have a very brief break and get on with the final talk. Unless there is no question, perhaps I could, could ask one, which is I, I wanted to know. Uh, we get this picture of compassion from uh, Christian tradition. To what degree can the kind of picture of compassion we have here enter into one's own uh, uh, interaction with other people and one's own attempt to interact with other people morally? Uh, and do you have to be a Christian or a Dominican friar in order to uh, uh, take away uh, uh, that from it? Well, what Julian says is actually quite interesting. She speaks of that natural love continued by grace. So that whole tradition of the Pieta implies there is a natural human compassion, maybe spoilt by sin, often obscured and difficult to achieve, but there's a basic natural drive to compassion and it's taken to a higher level by grace. So that tradition affirms the value of the natural feelings, but seeks to lift them to a higher, a more divine level, which would not have much meaning if you don't share the Christian faith. But we are still saying that God enacts compassion in the ministry and passion of Jesus. And that's at least a striking example of how compassion can look. But also that tradition of the works of mercy that Thomas's text expressed. In many of the works of mercy, of compassion, of misericordia that he lists, are things that many people do who aren't Christians. Mm. And I think it was a huge question to ask there for theologians. Um, are we saying that a lot of people are exercising human mercy in a way that's often more impressive than what some Christians do? Or are we saying that God's grace may be at work much more widely than just in the explicitly Christian body? And there were plenty of strands of thought that would suggest that God's mercy, God's grace, which was there in those long centuries before Christ, can also be there in the many peoples who are outside the explicitly Christian body. Mm -hmm. um, I think here, just towards the back there. Um, my question is um, in relation to justice. Can we actually say if we understand mercy as being in solidarity with Christ that the one who acts merciful always acts just as well, if it is in this embedded into Christ's merciful acting, that this is actually as well than justice and not, yeah. So we have the concepts of justice and mercy and St. Thomas speaks of different forms of justice in human society, the distributive and the commutative justice, giving people their due in various different contexts and he wants to speak of God's justice, which is really the wisdom of God doing all things in beauty and order, but sometimes, so to speak, giving things their due, and often giving things more than their due, giving gifts that go beyond what is strictly due to creatures or to us. And so if you want to speak of mercy and justice, then mercy is something bigger than justice. But I think there can be a way of taking justice which is rather wooden and narrow, 
or impersonal, a bit like that statue on the Old Bailey of this blind lady with her sword and her scales, which I think is a diminution of the traditional view of justice, actually. Um, but there can be people who speak of a kind of justice that seems to constrain what God may and may not do to us. And I think I'd rather see God as ultimate and prior and pouring out truth and goodness in a way which has beauty and wisdom and love and mercy. And we can focus on some of what God does and say, here we see what we can call justice, but much more greatly, widely we can see a loving wisdom and a merciful wisdom. Okay, uh, Samuel? Thank you very much for that. I found it extremely, extremely interesting. But you must um, uh, forgive me that I, uh, coming down from adrenaline, so I had a period <laughs> blackout. I, um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask, so, I was very interested in this account of reconciliation, reconciliation and the passions that you gave. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering if you could just say a little more about this um, relationship between, um, so these two things. Firstly, common passion, the sort of suffering will, that is made possible through the incarnation of the Christ, suffering cross. And then secondly, this mutual compassion, in, you know, without the, without the hyphen. And what exactly the role is that those are playing in, in making this kind of reconciliation between between um, humans and between God possible? Because I, I was thought that was very intriguing, but I'd like to know a little more. Okay. Yes, the, the notion of reconciliation implies there's been some kind of estrangement. So part of the Christian tradition is the doctrine of the fall and of sin, implying that humanity as a whole somehow fell away from communion with God, which has to be restored, and individual human beings fall away from communion with God in sin and have to be restored to God's friendship. And if you picture that as a matter of justice, so to speak, then we have offended God and the offence has to be somehow overcome and repaid. And I think there is some mileage in that. But in fact, more fundamentally, we have to be restored to friendship in God, with God. And that doesn't involve God changing. God is beyond change. It involves God changing us. And so what happens most basically in the passion of Christ, or to be richer in his passion, death, resurrection, that whole mystery, is that God attracts us back into friendship with himself and provides us with that strength of love that turns us from being sinners into being friends of God. So there you have that notion that Christ's passion attracts us back to friendship with God and the, the natural empathy with Christ's suffering is a kind of natural basis for that divine power there to draw all things back to himself. But the power works more widely because Plenty of people who lived before Christ suffered were attracted into friendship with God. The Old Testament's full of such people. There were many more than we are told about. So there's the attractive power of Christ's passion, but then also that proactive bestowal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ's passion, death, resurrection, the Holy Spirit, the divine love, is given into the world to enter into people and bring them personally back into friendship with God. 
and that's the, I think, the core picture of the reconciliation, God reaching out to grace and change us. Okay, I, I think we really must uh, keep moving on. So there'll be, a, again, a very short uh, three-minute break whilst we change over, and then we'll welcome our, our final speaker of the day. If we'd just like to thank Father Conrad once again. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>